appreciative, so appreciative. What does the world need right now? I've been thinking a, a lot about uh, the talk this week, the message, and uh, typically I may even change on Sunday morning two or three times what I'm going to say. <laughs> And it's okay because uh, I allow spirit to direct me and I, um, I want the proper, the right message to come through. There was a group of Americans made a trip with Brazilian natives down the Amazon River. The first day they rushed, second day they rushed, the next day they rushed, one day Anxious to continue on their trip, they were surprised to find the natives seated together in a circle. And when they asked why, a guide answered, they're waiting. They cannot move further until their souls catch up with their bodies. Interesting, huh? Let's allow our souls catch up. Sometimes we become so hurried, so busy, so uh, doing so many things and get it, getting ready to do the next thing, planning, whatever. We forget to take a moment to pause, don't we? Reflect. Allow our soul to catch up with us. And that means then that the brain is the one, the mental capacity, which is important, but it's doing all the work. There's another story about hurry up and wait, and we all know that story, don't we, as we're sitting at the airport sometimes <laughs> waiting for the next flight, and maybe it was canceled. We know how that goes. I love this story of a British Imperial Airlines, a company that pi pioneered air travel between England and Australia in the mid-1930s, if you can imagine. If you have time to spare, go by air, was the popular expression of that day. <laughs> Airliners were both slow and incapable of flying long distances. So it could take forever to make this flight. So one of the very first flights took off from Croydon Airport near London, flew to northern France where it was delayed extensively to, uh, due to bad weather. When it arrived in the south of France, one of the motors had failed and it was necessary to wait for another engine to be shipped from England by water. There were further lengthy delays along the route in Rome, Cairo, the Middle East, and et cetera, till finally the flight had progressed as far as Singapore, if you can imagine. So the, uh, uh, one of the flight directors noticed that this woman that was on the flight and she was ready to give birth. He says, lady, you never should have started on that trip in this condition. She said, I didn't. <laughs> We've all been on those type trips, haven't we? <laughs> Can you imagine? Poor thing, I suppose she never made it to Australia, huh? <laughs> Hurry up and wait. Hurry up and wait. We were given this time last year of COVID and it's still not completely over, but it almost is. Those things take time, they gradually go away. We were given this time to reset, weren't we? To reset. Now, one of the challenges if you're standing in front of a diverse group is that you know that you're gonna say something about slowing down. Well, some people have slowed down to the point they might turn into a fossil. So, okay, if you're, if you're doing that, I'm not talking to you today, okay? 
And we know that because there's still people that are hiding. COVID just gave them an opportunity to hide in a cave. And I've talked to you before about that, uh, that uh, fella on the uh, island of uh, Okinawa, was it, who had hidden from the war, and uh, he'd been there 26 years hiding in a cave. He was so afraid to come out. We weren't put on this earth to hide. We were given gifts. We were given uh, different gifts, diverse gifts. So I was, uh, I was also um, looking at some um, epitaphs. <laughs> I have a collection of them. I've sort of collected them, put them all in one place. Tombstone verses. And I find it interesting to note what is said about someone who's recently died. And granted, not all tombstone sayings are telling, like the one from Lester Moore. Now remember his name, Lester Moore, at Boot Hill Cemetery in Tombstone, okay? Here lies Lester Moore, four slugs from a 44, no less, no more. That's poor, but it's, it's the truth, I'm sorry, true. Or there's this one from Uniontown, Pennsylvania. Here lies the body of Jonathan Blake, stepped on the gas instead of the brake. <laughs> and instead of uh, an effort to explain how the uh, person died, the tombstone of Harry Edsel Smith of Albany, New York, states explicitly looked up the elevator shaft to see if the car was on the way down. It was. <laughs> That's poor too. <laughs> Television celebrity uh, Merv Griffin penned his own, I will not be right back after this message. <laughs> Oh, me. And some of the last words reveal more than the ceased may have wanted, like this one. Here lies a fellow who lived for himself and cared for nothing but gathering pelf. Now, where he is or how he fares, nobody knows and nobody cares. <laughs> and we've all known people like that, haven't we? We hope we've come to a time in this life where we're waking up and becoming a little different. As I mentioned last week, the last year has been as difficult for uh, spiritual leaders dealing with the political climate as it has the medical climate. So many rights, so many wrongs, and if you're a spiritual leader, you don't want to offend others and you want to be right there in the middle and not let them pull you, anyone pull you off of that place right in the middle. And I do a pretty good job of staying balanced no matter what I do. But it's the reason I am taking this sabbatical is that I have not taken one and I've been here in Gulfport 16 years and had full responsibility for the, uh, this church for 13 years. Never taken. We've taken a few trips, taken a few days off here and there. And it just became apparent a few weeks ago that uh, I need to take some time off. I need to be away for a little bit so that when I come back, I can savor everything again. I wrote something yesterday. Let me see if I, uh, if I have it with me. The wisdom to know when enough is enough. There is a bitter taste that is left in one's mouth when that last sip of coffee or tea 
was a bit more than enough. So are many things in our lives. Too long in relationships, too long in jobs, too long in careers, situations, and then. It becomes bitter. It can become bitter and unbearable. It's better to stop, take a breath, a breath, a breather, while one is ahead, when that bitterness has not yet taken a solid form, when there is only deep appreciation and love and caring. Yes, it's best to end with appreciation rather than a bitter taste in one's mouth. Maybe tomorrow, after one is renewed, one might be ready to savor again. I think each and every one of you know what I'm talking about here, and it happens with me every day when I, after I drink my coffee, I may have a cup or, or two, and then even though I may have gone and refilled my cup again, I may have two sips, and all of a sudden I decide, you know, that was enough. That was enough. I don't like that anymore. And if I were to force myself to go ahead and drink that cup, guess what would happen? I might start to hate it. So there, when I uh, uh, don't drink anymore, pour it down the drain, rinse my cup, I know that I'll be ready again tomorrow morning for that fresh cup of coffee, and it will not taste bitter in any way. Now, I'm not saying, I, I know this is a bit of a symbol for what I was talking about in my life, but we all know it's true. We all know it's true. By the end of COVID, so many relationships where people saw each other every day, and they're like, you know, I got to get away from you for a few hours. <laughs> enough is enough. I'm not saying forever here. <laughs> but Lord knows. I've got to go see something or somebody else. <laughs> enough is enough. And most of us have felt it in our careers. I know Miss Tammy shared with me about her prior career, and you knew, didn't you, when enough was enough, didn't you? Yeah. Or when uh, Pamela, you knew enough is enough. And I'm not saying that here. My career's not over. My career is not over, but holding this up for all these years and being responsibility for it, responsible for it, and then during COVID being responsible again for everything, where's the toilet paper, paper people ask me? Where's the, you know, and uh, we've, gotten, we've gotten to the point where we ask the spiritual leader that's supposed to be keeping her mind on the service every trivial question known to man. Where's the coffee? Where are the refreshments? Is the parking lot open? Who's supposed to be greeters? Who's gonna do podium? Where's the bulletin? Who did the bulletin? Is it correct? No, that's not correct. No, who's doing the uh, Friday night music? How soon do we start? Oh no, we're supposed to be wearing a mask all the time now. Who's going to be the guard at the door to make sure everybody's wearing masks? Should I go on or have I said enough? <laughs> uh, what'd you say? Oh. Yeah, when's potluck and what are you bringing, Reverend Judy? And when will you have it cleaned up? Well, I'm here to tell you I can't do it anymore. And either this spiritual community wants to pick up the slack or they don't. 
You've got 60 days to decide. That's not an ultimatum. It's just the truth. I'm going away for a while. I won't be here. If there are bulletins on Sunday, good. <laughs> if there are PowerPoints Sunday, better. We, um, the speaker that comes in here on Sunday, you treat them like royalty. Treat them like they just spent a week getting ready to speak to you on Sunday morning. Treat them like they have something worthwhile to say and you value it and you care. And you care enough that you'll come and you'll help with the odd jobs and not expect the person that's going to get up and speak on Sunday to do all that. Can you handle that? All of you out there in the listening audience, those who are brave enough to show up, can you handle that? So I'm going to uh, take a bit of a sabbatical. We have a new lady that's been hired. The board has hired, uh, or the leadership team, and several people are out of town this week uh, in their defense, Andrea and, and Tony and Bob and Diane, and just uh, list on and on. Summers are like that, we know, and we expect it. Um, it's been heavy on me because I didn't ever have a break during COVID. I didn't have the luxury of staying home. So those of you that are hiding, why don't you come on back out? See if you can help out here at your spiritual community. And so I had a couple of other funny stories to tell. Oh, I am going to tell this one. Then I'm probably going to be finished. I was laughing with Roger. I was telling him something uh, before the service about uh, people in their recliners. And uh, who was it, Foxworthy? Jeff Foxworthy. Um, I was going to say to everybody that's sitting in your recliner and turning into a fossil, get up. Sometimes I think recliners should never have been invented. <laughs> I was thinking about Jeff Foxworthy, and he's, uh, that funny skit where he's saying he thinks he hears somebody in the house, could you bring me a sandwich? <laughs> How lazy is that? Get up. We were meant to do more. There was the slide I was supposed to have up. Um, or page turner wasn't here this morning. So I'm turning pages too. It's okay. <laughs> I'm good at that too. So I do have one other little sweet story. It's about a talented violinist, Fritz Kreisler, tells how he once came across a beautiful instrument he wanted to acquire. When he finally raised the money for the violin, he returned to buy it and learned that it had already been sold to a collector. How many are collectors out there? I know my husband is. He collects big, big, big heavy equipment. We collect different things. He went to the new owner's home in order to try to persuade him to sell the violin. But the collector said it was one of his prized possessions. He could not let it go. The disappointed Chrysler turned to leave, but then asked a favor, may I play the instrument? Once more before it's consigned to silence. So permission was granted and the great musician began to play. The violin sang out a quality of music so beautiful that the collector himself was moved to tears. He said, I have no right to keep that to myself. The violin is yours. Take it into the world and let other people hear it. 
William Ward said, if you believe in prayer, pray. If you believe in serving, serve. If you believe in giving, give. For you and I are exquisite violins and our music is meant to be heard. I just implore each and every one of you to do what is in your heart to do. In what way can you serve? How can you be the instrument in the hands of God? I thank you for being here with me, and I will see you in about 60 days. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Reverend Judy. That was a uh, timely message about